Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Hey, how good is it that we can be here together and worship the Lord? Uh, it's such a wonderful day outside. I, I wasn't expecting it after the day we had yesterday, but how good is God? Uh, I'm just going to say a quick prayer, and then we're going to sing some worship and uh, enjoy this time together. So let, let's, let's bow our heads in prayer. God, I will give thanks to you. I will praise your name, the name of God, the Most High, because my life is yours. Help me to present myself as someone who belongs to you, Lord, and someone who doesn't need to be ashamed. All honour and power is yours, so let my whole life bring you glory, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said, Amen. So it says in uh, Isaiah chapter 15, verse 16, it says, But the, the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice, and the holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. That's right, we serve uh, a great God, a holy God, and we're going to sing of that now. So please uh, stand and worship together as we sing this next song. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what are the beauty such praises. What a the splendor that shines the sun. What a the majesty rules with justice. Only a holy God. Come and behold him.
you. Uh, we're still going to sing another song, and uh, I forgive you if you don't know this song because it's it's an original of mine. So this will be fun. We all get to sing one of my songs. So um, I actually wasn't expecting that this would become a church song, but it kind of got asked that we would give it a go. So here we are giving it a go. So this song is called uh, "Raining Sunlight," and um, yeah. This is how it goes. I am not worthy and will never be. My heart of sin is controlling me. I need a savior. I need a friend I call to the heavens A quiet amen I know I have your story Shut your hand, you give me all love, you're the 
the key I need you more than the air that I breathe You reach out your hand And I do receive Thank you. Please be seated as I welcome Pastor PJ to give us the announcements. Morning, morning everyone. Morning and to those watching at home, good morning also. And thank you very much, Leon and the team. That was an amazing song, by the way. Great, it's really great. Ah, uh, just, just for the um, usual announcements, I have to start off with a COVID reminder. So again, we continue to keep on um, social distancing, 1.5 meters, um, and the usual um, COVID safety measures, so don't forget that. Also, log in or check in when you come in through the door. Um, we will be having communion this morning, so if you've, have, if you've already gotten your communion elements, um, that would be great. For those watching um, online, if you want to participate in communion um, in a few minutes, I suggest you might prepare maybe um, some bread and some juice um, so that you could participate um, as well. Um, this Thursday, we'll be having a midweek service, so that is 10.30 a.m. Um, the Downs will be here, the Downs family, they're back, and they will be at that service and also some other events on that day. Liz will come up later to tell us more about that and other um, more uh, missionary information. Um, also, there are leaflets. If you've received the bulletin, do you receive the bulletin by your email? There are also some leaflets attached to that regarding the March for Life of Brisbane. That's on May 8th. And then there's also a Christian Women's Communicating International event on the 17th of May. Uh, it's changing world, changing values. So if you're interested in those, look at those leaflets, and um, there will be more information there. On the 5th of May, um, at, uh, that's Wednesday, 1 p.m., um, Pastor Cam, our beloved Pastor Cam's memorial service will be here at the church. So this coming Wednesday, 1 p.m. Uh, for more information about that, uh, you can ask as well. Um, also on, on the same Wednesday at, at 7.30 p.m. at night, there will be prayer time here at church. This is open to everyone. So if you want to join and to pray with us as a group, as a church, 7.30 p.m. this coming Wednesday, May the 5th. All right, so that's, I think that's all that I have for the announcements for this morning. Oh, Paul has some more announcements. Yes? Oh, so Paul has reminded me that the wafers in the communion packs, they're not gluten-free. So for those who, you know, have a thing with gluten, um, don't, don't use the wafers for, for that. Um, all right, just, just a safety, safety reminder there. Um, with that, obviously, we still don't pass the offering baskets around, but again, there is a box in the back that you can put offering in, or better, you can do giving online. So if you go to the website of Clontarf Beach Baptist Church, um, there are options there to show how we can give online. So let me just pray, and then afterwards, I'll call up Liz for our missionary uh, information. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you this beautiful day that you've given us. Thank you for the wonderful weather today. Thank you that you've given us the strength and the ability um, to either come here to church or to watch online. Thank you for the technology that is now available to us. I pray that you just bless us as we worship you together as your children. Also, thank you for the privilege to give back um, through the offering and be part of the work that you are doing in the world. We pray that you guide us and teach us how to use whatever is collected um, for your glory and, of course, for the advancement of your kingdom. We thank you so much for your love every day. We just want to live for you. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it is a very busy week this week, and we need to really pray that all the different events will be bring glory to the Lord, especially farewelling our dear pastor on Wednesday and then followed by Thursday church, at which our missionary speakers, Tim and Mel Downs, will be sharing. So if you're able to come this Thursday, 
it would be great. You can bring your own lunch. Um, food can't be shared yet. So um, please come and join us Thursday morning at 10.30. It will be quite amazing. Um, and then we'll have lunch in the hub. Tea and coffee will be provided. At night, Tim and Mel will still be here and there'll be a special evening. Uh, we're going to have pizzas at 7. If you want to come for pizza, please let me know today and, if possible, uh, slip me $5 or uh, tomorrow or the next day because um, I need to get the orders done. And um, then they'll be sharing. The young adults will be hosting this event, so um, we'd like to encourage as many as possible to come along because they've opened it up to, for everybody to attend. But we just need to know the numbers if you'll be here at seven. Um, and also, um, sorry, there was something else I wanted to tell you about that. Anyway, um, in May, Global Interaction, our Baptist mission, have a special May Mission Month every year. So that starts today. So in May, every Sunday morning and Thursday morning, we'll have a little mission DVD. They only go for about three minutes. And today, we've got one in a moment, and it is Tim Downs, uh, who's coming Thursday, with his wife Mel, and he's sharing with a Yao believer. Now, 20 years ago, none of the Yao knew about the Lord Jesus and Global Interaction uh, under the Lord's guidance chose the Yao and the way people who we um, pray for um, as one of the eight unreached people groups um, to send missionaries to. And that happened with the Yao 20 years ago and Tim and Mel have been there 10 of those 20 years. And so they have seen in remarkable ways people come to know Christ and hear about the Lord Jesus for the very first time in their lives. So now there's significant faith communities amongst the Yao. There's 3 million Yao in Malawi and um, quite near the borders with Mozambique, um, but they live in very simple village situations, not many conveniences, struggle to grow their own food. They're very poor people, but they are increasingly uh, coming to know Jesus. So um, I'm just going to pray for them now and then we'll see this little video of Tim and a Malawi believer. Loving Father, we just thank you for the enormous privilege of being involved in praying for a people group who have so recently, only in the last 20 years, heard about you. And we just ask that as we lift them up to you, there will be many, many thousands of them will come to faith. We thank you for Tim and Mel, who will be with us this Thursday, and for the way that they have absolutely devoted their lives to reaching the Yale for Christ. We pray for safety upon them as they travel all around Queensland, sharing the news of what this has been in the last 10 years of their lives and bringing two boys up there in Malawi who are now um, almost finished their high school years and we just pray that it will really impact our church in an amazing way this Thursday. We thank you in anticipation in Jesus' name. Amen. So now we'll watch the little DVD and hope to see you Thursday. G'day. I'm Tim Downs and I'm part of a team of global interaction, intercultural workers based here in Malawi in Africa. 
It's a very, very exciting time of the year in Malawi, December. It's because that's when the rain's coming. You see the new growth and the, and the green and the maize growing and, and it looks like, looks like we're gonna have a good crop this year. I guess what I'm really excited about is the growth in some of the faith communities. Just want to tell you a story about a young fellow whose name is Dog. He, um, he came to the Lord about two years ago. We baptised him and we've been discipling him intentionally for that last little while. Just last week, sitting up in his village, it was, it was a time that we'd organised where he was going to take the Bible study. So the week before, he chose a passage of scripture himself, something out of Ezekiel. And he, he, he said he read it every night, praying that God would reveal to him something to share. So the day came, and here's this young fella, sitting there quite nervous. His wife was sitting beside him, a bit embarrassed about his foray into the, into the realm of teaching. There was a group of people, 20 or 30 people, and Dogu started unpacking what he believed God was sharing and teaching him and the group from this passage of scripture. It was in his village, it was in his language, and it was in his culture. And I just sat there as the missionary who'd been coming out of this place for about eight years. And I was being fed the word of God by this young fella. You know, I couldn't have been prouder, hey? And at the end, I just shared in front of him, but in front of the group, I said, you know, I've been coming out here for so long, feeding you guys. But today, you guys were feeding me. You know, this is a big milestone for any global interaction intercultural worker just to see the people that we're discipling into actually taking the banner and recognising, you know what, it's now our job to teach our people. That's a bit of what's happening here in Malawi. We're seeing that in, in the adult literacy program. We're seeing that in some of the translation work. We're seeing that in our youth group. We're seeing that in our kids' clubs. We're seeing that in our faith communities in the village. Local believers rising up and, 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 and doing what they believe God has called them to do sharing the kingdom in their culture you know we've got new people coming over and it's going to look a bit different for these guys they're not the main people but they actually support and work alongside the main people we're intentionally becoming more support people it's very exciting it's very encouraging let that be something that excites you as you go into christmas not just the birth of jesus but the birth of a faith community in malawi africa thank you Amazing, amazing to hear what God is doing, not just through the missionaries, but even through the everyday people um, in their own communities. Praise God for that. And now we'll be moving on to our communion for this morning. Um, for that, would you turn to me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, let's all turn to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. So I'll be reading from the NIV, but um, you can follow along with the translations that you have. So it says here, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and we, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Jesus is asking all of us, his disciples, to keep remembering him, to keep remembering his amazing and great love for us, that really moved him to give himself up for us. He took on a body, he took on flesh and blood, so that he can give his life for us because he loves us so much. He wanted to give us an opportunity to have eternal life with him. And so Jesus gave himself up for us. And that is what he wants us to remember when we have communion. His love, his sacrifice for us. In another, in another letter of the Apostle Paul, still to the Corinthians, but this time in 2 Corinthians, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, so this time we'll be moving to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in ver from verse 14, I'll be reading from verse 14 to verse 21, this is what the Apostle Paul also tells us um, about how we should respond to our remembrance or appreciation of God's love for us. 
Paul says from verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5, For Christ's love compels us. For Christ's love compels us. It moves us. It, it directs our lives. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So as we remember Jesus' love and sacrifice for us, he also wants us to keep in mind that we too should now live for him out of gratitude, out of appreciation for what he has done for us. And that's why when we have communion, it, it also motivates us and moves us to live as Jesus would want us to live in our everyday lives, no longer just for our own ambitions, our own desires, our own passions, or our wants, but we now want to live for Jesus because we now love him in return. We respond to his love by loving others as well. And I'll end with this. If we're wondering, so how does Jesus want me to love him and other people? What can I do in my daily life to really show um, that I love God and I love others? I'll, I'll continue reading um, 2 Corinthians 5. It says from verse 16, So from now on, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So Christ is no longer secondary. He's always primary. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is a, is a Christian, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So one way of truly showing our love for God and love for other people is to help people grow in their relationship with Jesus or to start that relationship with Jesus. The ministry of reconciliation has been given to us from God to help others experience eternal life as well. Isn't that an amazing privilege? And again, it's the love of God that compels us to do this. Praise God. Praise God. So as we go to communion, what I'll do, I'll be silent now for maybe a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds. And you, let's all pray on our own about um, what God has done for us. I mean, to, to thank Him and to praise Him. And then um, as we pray, let's also ask God, how does He want me to to live out the ministry of reconciliation. And then when you're ready, whenever you're ready, you can um, eat the wafer. And then after I pray, I'll, I'll be praying for all of us, after I pray, that is when we'll drink the juice together as a symbol of our unity in Christ. So I'll give that moment, well, maybe 30 seconds for us to all pray individually, and then I will pray. Again, you can, you can eat the, the, the wafer, the bread, anytime you're ready. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you so much for your great love for us. Thank you, God, that you sent your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
to become a man and to die on the cross to pay for our sins so that we can have eternal life with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for willingly coming down from heaven and giving yourself up for us. We love you so much, Lord Jesus, for what you've done. Help us to truly respond to you by living our daily lives for you. Teach us how to love you more than anything and how to love others as you have loved us. Help us to accomplish the, the work, the ministry that you have given to each and every one of us, the ministry of reconciliation, that we might be able to love others by helping them get to know you as well, by helping them to also experience eternal life with you. Teach us how to do this every day, Lord. Thank you that we can do it through your love for us and through the Holy Spirit who is now with us. Thank you, God. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's drink together. Thank you. All right, we're going to... Actually, is there a kids' church this morning? All right, well, the kids can move out as we sing this next song. And uh, after this song, we're going to have Andrew bring us a sermon. So let us stand and worship the Lord together as we sing this.
caring enough for us that you you gave your son to die for us. We are forever grateful and we praise your holy name. Please uh, prepare our hearts and minds now to hear from your word and speak through Pastor Andrew as he brings it to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning to everyone in the room and to everyone online. My name is Andrew. It's great to be here. It's lucky for me to be here, actually. Although I don't believe in luck, we're blessed uh, that I'm here because my wife is away and she's only been gone for two days and we're feeling it at home already. My son, Micah, and I are a little bit wriggly around the edges. Uh, Things aren't so good. Um, I must say, too, that um, not... um, don't really enjoy those cups of the communion stuff. I don't know why it is, but my hatred for them has gone through the roof. Uh, I do miss Cam heaps, and one of the things that uh, made me miss him was I had to take communion in an old folks' home that he used to do, and they were, oh, please, can you keep doing it? So I went to do it. And so I thought, oh, beauty, here's an opportunity for me. I I took along a whole stack of those things. There was about 15 of them and me, and so I'm up the front and telling them, okay, guys, let's just peel off the top layer, and they all, you know, they've got arthritis like this. And so I individually went around to each person and took off the lid and let them eat the bread. And then, then, silly me, I go, and now we're going to do the cup. Oh, no. So then I had to go around and individually each time open the cup for them as well. So uh, it's, that's life. That's life. Well, we are up to uh, Revelation chapter 17, and I'm going to read all of chapter 17 and all all of chapter 18 and even four verses of chapter 19. Um, I, because it's such a long passage, I almost decided not to read it at all. But then I thought, you won't have any idea what we're talking about. So I thought, we've got to read it anyway. Um, so I'm going to read it really fast. I hope that's okay. I'll just read fast, and you can follow along with the words on the screen. I hope they're there. Here we go. As is our custom, you can follow along on the Bible app or go to that link, and you'll be able to see this stuff on your device. I do this. People go, why do you do that? I'm there. Well, I know what it's like. You need something to say when you need to justify your playing of games on your device during church. You can just say, I was looking at the PowerPoint. I'm looking at the PowerPoint. You can open it up and just sort of flick it across and have your game going and then flick it back if anybody asks. I didn't tell you that. I learned that from the young people. (laughs) If anything goes wrong in church, you know this, don't you? If anything ever goes wrong in a church, it's the young people's fault. It's true. I've heard heard it many times. Here we go. Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And then we're going to do the first four verses of 19 as well. You ready to go? Here we go. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I shall show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and the unclean things of her immorality. And upon her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. 
Is this sounding right to you? Am I reading a different version? What version is that? You can work it out? You guys are smart. That's what, yeah, you can't put one over you at all. I try every week and it never happens. Here we go. <laughs> Paul's killing himself laughing. You haven't tried to put one over us, have I? Have you? Yeah. Yeah, all complaints. He's not here, by the way, my son Micah. He is the complaints manager or complaints engineer or whatever. He's in upper management. If you have a complaint, just take it to him. Stop interjecting, we've got a long way to go. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered, great, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I shall tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And aren't you glad because you've got not a blue clue what's going on. So, now I've lost my spot. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and to go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Uh, still back here. Seven mountains on which the woman sits, and, um, 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 and they are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. And the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth, and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. Are you sorting all of this out? I thought you were smart. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings and those who are with him are called, chosen and faithful. And he said to me, the waters which you saw were the har where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. For God has put in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. And the woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. You going all right? Good. After these things, this is chapter 18 now. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and she's become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passions of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive of her plagues. Was that, is it right? You're going to control this. <laughs> Risk. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she is paid and give back to her double according to her deeds in the cup which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I'm not a widow and I will never see mourning. For this reason, one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she'll be burned up with fire for the Lord God who judges her is strong. 
<laughs> and the kings of the earth who commit an acts of immorality and live sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, whoa, whoa, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wooden bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves, basically everything, including human slaves." And the fruit you long for has gone from you and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, woe, woe, the great city, she was clothed in fine linen and purple scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For one in one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance. And they were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning saying, what city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour, she's been laid waste. She went, we would say, she's gone from hero to zero. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and your saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. And a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea saying, thus will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. Just wanna throw something in there. The other day I was at a wedding and they had a harpist there. Have you ever heard a real harp? Absolutely unbelievable. And the skill, I thought it was just some strings in, you know, and you just go like that. There's foot pedals. There's all sorts of stuff going on with the harp. Amazing things. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in just so that you don't all go, will he hurry up and come to the end of this reading? Ah. So the flute players and the trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer and no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer and the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer and the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer for your merchants were the great men of the earth because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery and in her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and all have been slain on the earth. After these things, this is chapter 19 now. After these things I heard, as it were, a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous for he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. There you go. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna talk. Lord, we thank you for your word. This passage is difficult to understand and it's long. Please help us as we come to understand it, in Jesus' name, amen. I was reminded yesterday or the day before, I can't remember which, it's all a blur since my wife has gone, a whole of life is just fuzzy. But it was 1988, uh, back when, and yesterday or the day before was the anniversary of the World Expo opening. It also happened to be, I remember it because it was the year that my wife and I, my wife and I um, moved to Queensland, 1988. That long ago, we were both four years old. <laughs> uh, well, 
the funny thing was we moved to Queensland in 1988 and I think we must have been just about the only people who didn't actually go to the expo. We didn't know what it was. We hadn't participated in any of the hype and build up to it. We just didn't go. Um, but I did have a friend who went who came away absolutely disgusted by the World Expo. And this is what he said. I'll never forget it. He said to me, where is God at the World Expo? He probably didn't go to the, uh, there was a Christian pavilion, the pavilion of promise. He probably didn't go there. All the rest of it though, he said, he said, all that it is, is a glorification of man and his achievements. That's what he said. And I, I really feel this because I, I'm a child of my own age, of my own era. And since then, since 1988, mankind has mapped DNA. We hold the keys to unlocking the secrets of life. And we have treatments developing for any number of diseases that many years ago were not considered treatable. We now are using genetic understandings to provide medicines that are going to cure us of a whole lot of diseases. There's a whole lot of stuff that's happened ever since 1988 and it's renewing the faith of the humanistic faithful that we will one day eventually be able to solve all of our problems. We're going to get smart enough. We're going to know enough. We're we're going to be able to develop ourselves to be those who can keep going. That's how hum humanism thinks. And in stark contrast to that type of thinking today, what we see in the future as God presents it in the Bible is that man will not be glorified at all. In fact, it's going to only be God who gets the glory. And in fact, the opposite is true. All the achievements of man, all the great developments of man are going to be wiped. In fact, we may well be described as the pinnacle of human achievement. This, this place called Babylon is going to be utterly destroyed and God will be declared the Lord of all. Well, Handel's Messiah, the chorus of Handel's Messiah, his Hallelujah Chorus, is one of the most recognized tunes on the earth. Do you know it? Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's, it is. Everybody knows about it. It's been described as the best song of praise ever, but few know that it was motivated by Revelation 19, the only place in the New Testament where the word Hallelujah appears. So we know the music, but few of us realize it's motivated by the praise of God. The Bible describes the praise of God when he smashes the pinnacle of human achievement. Hallelujah, he's wiped it. It's a challenge to me. I am a child of my generation. See, in my lifetime, we've made it to the moon. We can artificially conceive children. We genetically modify plants to produce what we want when we want it. And at the same time, be pest resistant. And if you go, oh, where do you get those plants? Have a chat to a cotton farmer. It's real for them. That's how they do it. We can clone animals and it won't be long until we can clone people. It's difficult to not be taken up by the humanistic thinking of our day, the optimism that our achieve, achievements seem to present, the fact of our technological advancement, all points to one thing, that man is supreme. When all along the truth is that all good comes from God and not man, and we fail to notice that our praise of man should actually be praise of God. And the truth is we can't worship both. We have a difficult task here this morning, a huge section of scripture, which is often taken to be most difficult. And I'm gonna reduce it all down to one great thing. That is, man develops here, God is way, way bigger. We're gonna take away some of the mystery, uh, maybe not 
you're all going to be experts on Revelation 17 and 18 after today. Um, I've got this watch. It's so good. I can't see the hands. <laughs> yep, can't tell. Got some advice. When you're handling the book of Revelation, listen carefully. It's true of all of the book of Revelation, and we've talked about this before, but it's good to remind you today as we come to a section that can be quite, what is that about? All right, so here's some advice. Go from the general to the particular. Go from the general. What is this generally about? What is this a picture of? If you try to get, oh, what's this little bit? What's this little bit? What's this little bit? You're going to get lost. But if you just get the general big gist of it, it's usually not that hard. If you start there and then work down into the particular, you're going to end up better off. Um, so get the general picture first and don't get bogged down on the smaller, smaller points. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's good to be biblical. You need to stick to the biblical revelation and not try and extrapolate what it says into information that's not been revealed by God. For example, it describes in the book of Revelation an evil figure who's going to rule the world. We know him as the Antichrist. What the Bible does is describe what he's like, what he does, it describes a whole lot of stuff about him. The only thing it doesn't say is who it is. And so everyone starts immediately going, whoa, there's going to be an antichrist. It wouldn't be an antichrist, but who is it? And they try and have a guess. They try and have a guess. I thought it was, you know, the Russian guy Gorbachev with the birthmark on his head. Remember him? Yeah, I'm showing my age now. He was the, you know, he had a birthmark on his head. Pretty sure if you peel those, that birthmark back, you're going to see a number on there. That's what I thought, but I was wrong, obviously. Uh, but you get what I mean. The Bible doesn't say who the Antichrist is. That's all right to try and have a guess. Go, go crazy. But you're not going to hear me saying from here, a pulpit, hey, this is who it is because I don't have a blue clue. I'm just having a guess. You've got to stick with what the Bible says and not be having a guess. All right? You got that? Oh, excellent. All right, what we're going to do is describe the two main characters in this section. That's the prostitute or Babylon the Great and then the beast. He won't take long because we already know who he is. I want us to get a picture of this place called Babylon in the Bible because the word appears hundreds of times in the scriptures and most of the time it's referring to the city of Babylon but on a few occasions including Revelation 7 and 18 it becomes very significant but there are other passages as well. I want us to get this picture about Babylon. You all know the word Babylon don't you? Yeah. It's a place. Genesis 11, 1 to 9. Is that readable by you? Now, the whole earth had one language. You, you, you get in the place here, Genesis chapter 11. This is not long after the flood, right at the beginning of things. All right? Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there and they said to one another, come, let's make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they, which, you know, well, I don't know what you do with bricks, it makes them tough. And they had brick for stone and they had bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they have all one language and this is only the beginning of what they will do and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. 
Come, let us go down. And they confused their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, which because there the Lord confused their language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. It's interesting that here we have this place called Babel. They thought it was the gate of heaven, the gate of God and God renamed it and made it the uh, place of confusion, which the word Babel actually means. But God looked at humanity, saw them with their one language, saw them with their one culture, saw them trying to become up as high as God. Um, If you've ever seen a male dog, I've seen male dogs, you know, they think that being the highest is the sign of being the alpha dog. And I've seen dogs, no joke, I've seen people sitting on a couch watching television and a male dog come climb up on them and try and sit on their heads to get onto the top to be the highest. Some of you with dogs are going, yep, yep, I see this. And this is what it was with people. They're trying to get up to heaven to be as high as God. And God says, no. But it's interesting, when you think of the picture of the book of Revelation, where you've got one world government, you've got one guy who's evil running the show, you think about it, what you have to have is the ability to communicate over all the earth you're starting to get a situation, a picture that's similar to the original Tower of Babel. And God isn't gonna let it happen. He's gonna bring it all to an end. You all right? It's not insignificant that this place that we're reading about in Revelation is called Babylon, Babel, right? You getting this? One of my favorite Bible characters on the bad side of things is Neb, Nebuchadnezzar. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of, oh, look at that, Babylon. And the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon which I have built? by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. <laughs> what a pompous puss. While, w- while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Neb, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And you can just see him about to answer back, right? I I can see him going, I get real when all of a sudden, Boom, immediately the word was fulfilled against Neb. He was driven from among men and he ate grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as an eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason was returned to me and I blessed the Most High and I praised and honoured him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation and all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? And at the same time, my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me and I was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all of his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Thus says King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the most powerful man on the earth, he was in charge of the most powerful kingdom the world had ever known up until that time. The capital city of that place was Babylon. There is the eight wonders, the seven wonders of the world. One of them is the hanging gardens of Babylon. 
And notice the change, the change in the king, the pompous puss, and all of a sudden he is at the bottom of the rung. God did it. Babylon is a city that symbolizes the greatness of human achievement. Next. How you going, all right? I'm going good. I'm in no hurry. Because my wife's not home. (laughs) Isaiah 13. No, don't bring me a basket of goodies. Thanks. This is a prophecy, uh, you guessed it, against Babylon. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And as we've seen in the book of Revelation, none of that language should be a surprise to us. And like a hunted gazelle or like sheep with none to gather them, each will turn to his own people and each will flee to his own land. Whoever is found will be thrust through and whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Behold, I am stirring up the meads against them and have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bowls, their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. Now, I just want you to get here that you've got there the pronouncement of the Medes and Persians taking over the northern kingdom of Israel, of of taking over the people of God. And it's a picture, it's a historical reality back then, but there's also the bigger picture. That's exactly what's going to happen in the end as well. But then it goes on. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrows them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch its tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will lie lie down there and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell and their wild goats will dance. Hyenas will cry in its towers and jackals in the pleasant palaces. Its time is close at hand and its days will not be prolonged. A prophecy of Babylon's destruction. But did you notice what it it says in verses 11 and 12. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Babylon as a city represents the, the pride, represents the achievements, represents haughtiness, it represents all the greatness of man, but God will punish it. Jeremiah 51, how Babylon is taken, the praise of the whole earth seized, how Babylon has become a horror among the nations. So you've got the beast, the boast of the whole earth seized. It's the same place of human pride. I want you to understand that Babylon in the Bible is a word that describes a literal city, but that city represents all the human pride and achievement that humanists today seem to think provides an optimism, seems to think provides the the truth that man is in control of this place when we know it ain't, that that ain't true and we're denying the realities of life to think it. And you know, we should all be reminded that it's not true every time we go to a funeral. You going good? That's the introduction done. That's, man, I'm not joking. 
we better, we better hurry up here. Can you guys remember when we looked at the prophet Daniel? Yeah, and remember these slides? I hope that you were all here going, yes, I remember. That's fantastic. Ha ha, oh, it all makes sense now. Because we're talking about the final kingdom here in the book of Revelation. We're talking about its existence, what it was like, and the kingdom of God comes and smashes it and takes over. Remember Neb, King Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the giant statue and all the different parts represented the different kingdoms that were coming in the future? Is all of this making sense? You have to pay extra money to get all of this. So here we are. We're talking about a final kingdom. And this is how I explained it. I gave you some options even. Remember this? And we were talking about the Antichrist. We looked at the visions in the book of Daniel. And all of a sudden, you know, when I read the book of Revelation, it all starts to make sense. And I suggested to you, this is the one I like the most. You have the Babylonian Empire, then the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire led by Alexander the Great. And then there came the Roman Empire. Jesus was in here. Then there's this huge gap. And then there's going to be a kingdom like this one. I reckon it's going to be like it. Is it going to be exactly it? Well, it could be. I don't know, I'm guessing, but I reckon it's going to be like it. There's going to be a gap and then God's kingdom's going to take over. What we're describing here, this Roman-like kingdom, is going to be one that's run by this dude called the Antichrist and all of his king buddies that we read about here, the seven kings, the ten kings and all of them. That's this kingdom here. That's run by them. And you can bet your bottom dollar, one of the greatest cities in that kingdom, what's the name of the city? You might like to call it the capital. If it's not the actual capital, the focus of this kingdom in the world is going to be a city whose name is, does anyone want to have a guess? Rome. It's got seven hills. There's a Bible scholar right there. It's going to be Rome, everyone's going to know it as Babylon the Great. You getting all this? I reckon having gotten that, you guys are smart, uh, you, can, you can now read Revelation 17 and 18 and go, oh yeah, I'm not real sure what it means by this, I'm not real sure what it means by that, these finer details I'm not sure, but the big picture you should have. Am I right? Okay. So, is Babylon, what is this Babylon the Great in Revelation 17? Well, it could be a literal city. It might actually be Rome. It could be the actual place in the Shinar Valley that gets rebuilt. It's situated now, that place is now in Iraq and I hear whispers that it is being rebuilt and resettled and so I go, that's another reason to look up the rapture may be soon. Babylon in Revelation may well be the literal rebuilding of the ancient city. It may also be Rome. I don't want to fight about it. I just want you to understand the big general picture that at the end of human history, there will be a horrible seven year period in which there will be one world ruler who is the Antichrist, who will be at once the head of the one world government and the head of a one world religion, an evil dictator over the whole show. And it's as if central office will be at a place called Babylon. And all the achievements of man will be focused on that great man and in that great city, he will have to have a main office somewhere and I think it's gonna be this city. He stands for the pride of man. Fancy bringing all the people together. Fancy administering the whole earth and the descriptions of the great commerce and all the wealth and the riches that we have read about in Revelation 17 and 18. All the greatness of man focused through one evil individual in an evil place. That place is Babylon. What chapter 17 and 18 is about is about the greatness of that place and about how swiftly it gets destroyed and everything that it stands for just disappears. This is more than just a city. The chapter personifies the city and what it stands for and graphically or poetically, if we like, presents it to us. 
It is a woman recognizable as a prostitute just by sight. Gorgeous and drunk, riding an ugly animal. That's the picture that's given. It's the city and the philosophies and the religious practices within her. She is a cesspool of greed, lust, and godlessness. It's gonna be a big city. That's why it's called Babylon the Great. It will have influence. It will rule over the whole earth. That's what verse 15 is about in chapter 17. You know, she was sitting on waters that you saw. The prostitute is seated. What's that? Their peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. In other words, she's over the whole earth. The city's gonna have great wealth. Those who live there will know luxury. It will also be a city of vice. She is the mother of harlots and it will be a religious city, but the religion there will only be sorcery and superstition. It's always a cruel city drunk with blood. You all got this picture? And it's gonna get smashed. And everyone, Angels, people in heaven are gonna sing hallelujah when it's gone. The beast. The beast is easy. He's the antichrist, the same one as we read earlier about in chapter 13. He is this world ruler. He, you know, all this stuff about he was and he is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. It appears as though he's gonna be a lesser ruler than disappear, fade out, even die, and then supernaturally be brought back to power. He's gonna be an actual takeoff of the real Christ, Jesus, who died and rose again. And so people are gonna think, whoa, look, he's gone and he's back. He appears to be the eighth of a dynasty of kings, but he will ascend and rule over 10 kings who will reign with him for just how long? One hour, just a short period of time. And together they'll set their faces against Christ. It's strange that at the end of chapter 17, these kings turn against the city, are involved in its destruction by God's hand. And chapter 18 is the reaction of the different ones to the news of the fall of the city. All the merchants, all the merchants are so afraid of what's happening and the speed with which the city is destroyed that they just stand afar off at a distance, a bit like people watching a nuclear holocaust, interested to see, but whoa, I don't wanna go there. I've been puzzled by why Handel's Messiah, we struggle to understand that the Hallelujah Chorus is describing such destruction. I don't know if that, it, it just amazes me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, the greatest piece of music in history. And we, did you know? that it's about the destruction of Babylon? What, what Babylon stands for, what humanity has taken on board, it's, it's incredible how opposite we are to the gospel. You see, the gospel and the kingdom of God are exactly different than how the city of Babylon presents. You see, the, in the kingdom of God, the humble are exalted. In the kingdom of God, the greatest are the servants of all. Didn't it happen like this, that the king of God's kingdom arrived in a stable and not in a palace in a great city? Didn't it happen that the king of the kingdom of God had a manger and not a throne? Didn't it happen that the king of the kingdom died on a cross of shame and was buried in a borrowed tomb? Human pride, the exaltation of humanity works and drives 
our society. It even works in our own thinking. We have hubris that lifts ourselves up and we want to rebel against our creator. And what the picture of Revelation 17 and 18 says is no. And eventually the values of the kingdom will rule the earth. You're hearing all this? Sometimes we need to change our thinking. Shift our values on their head. The humble will be exalted. The proud will be taken down and taken down in a hurry. All of the achievements of humanity, as wonderful as it is, We should be praising God instead. Well, you go, why is he rushing through all this stuff? 17, wouldn't it be good to go slower? I, I, I'm so excited about what's coming in chapter 19. In chapter 19, Jesus comes back. I can't wait to get there, so I'm kind of rushing. Plus, after Jesus comes back, there's a whole lot of good stuff going on. There's heaven and streets of gold and all of that. And I want to get there quick. I hope you are with me on that. Agreed? Too bad. We're, that's what's happening. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Lord, it is humbling to read of how this great city described for us. It's its philosophies, its religion, all that it stands for, it really is the glory and the greatness of humanity. All represented in this grand city. It's a city of vice. It's a city of violence. It's a city of huge wealth, decadence, hedonism, and it all is white. really fast from hero to zero and Lord it shakes our values and I pray that you'd help us to take the values of the kingdom where the humble are exalted where the greatest amongst us are the servants of all and Lord I pray that you would help us to be, well, to heed the warnings of the scriptures of how this world is going to end. Lord, we work, we have one eye on our jobs and our work, our family and what's happening here. And we should have one eye on the sky for when you, the ruler of this universe, will take those who know and love you to be with yourself. One eye on the earth and one eye in the sky. Keep us walking that way, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Now we're going to sing Handel's Messiah. (laughs) No, I wish. Uh, No, we're going to sing this song called One Day When We All Get to Heaven. So let's stand and sing together. Thank you.
Jesus, thank you that this world is in your hands and that you are coming. Help us to look for you to come. We will see you face to face. Lord, help us to live that way this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning to you all and good morning to everyone online. Great to have you here.